Today, we'll be discussing the world of cancer treatments and oncology. Unfortunately, cancer is a disease that in one way or another will affect almost everybody. There are a range of different treatments ranging from the traditional, such as chemotherapy or surgery, to the emerging. And radiopharmaceuticals is an emerging form of treatment that's attracting a lot of attention as well as investment. Today, we'll be discussing the story of Radio Farm Theranostics. This is a Paul Hopper founded biotech. We all know that Paul Hopper is a prolific biotech investor, entrepreneur, as well as leader. And Radio Farm Theranostics are hoping to play their part within the chain, both on the diagnostics as well as the therapeutic side. We're really excited to be welcoming to the channel the CEO and Managing Director of Radio Farm Theranostics, Ricardo Canaveri. Ricardo, welcome to the channel. Thank you very much for having me. There's been a lot of recent news in the Radio Farm Theranostic story. We'll be covering all of that throughout the interview. However, for those who are not familiar, did you want to talk about who Radio Farm Theranostics is and what role you are trying to play within the cancer treatment space? Of course. So uh, Radio Farm Theranostic is a um, recently created startup, a biotech startup. Our mission is really to play an important role in oncology. And the way we want to do this is with our specific core business that are the radio pharmaceutical imaging and therapy. So our objective is really to be a leading player uh, among the radio pharmaceutical company, uh, leveraging our um, deep pipeline and also very innovative molecule that we like to bring to patients as soon as possible. For sure. And I think... Unfortunately, everybody will know someone or someone around them has been affected by cancer. It's a terrible illness. So, and obviously, any company that's able to be able to make that tangible difference is one that people will really be getting behind. But can to really paint that picture in the context, can you talk about cancer treatment currently and then why Radio Pharmaceuticals has to play that role to be able to serve as an emerging treatment? Absolutely. So in the last 20 years, there has been... Uh, quite traditional approach to cancer treatment, mainly, you know, surgery, of course, chemotherapy, and more recently, targeted therapy. But it's really only in the last six to seven years that we saw two additional emerging pillars, immuno-oncology and cell and gene therapy. And these two pillars are really expected to grow significantly. So we ask ourselves, what else? What else can be important in oncology for patient and physician? And we really believe that the next frontier in oncology will be the radiopharmaceutical therapies. Two of them are already in the market, um, launched by uh, Novartis, approved by FDA. Uh, so a proof of concept that these therapies are safe and effective is already there, but there is so many opportunity, multiple cancer type to apply this approach. That is exactly what Radio Farm Theranostic would like to do. For sure. And so for those of viewers who might not be as familiar with Radio Pharmaceuticals, I think I've heard you previously describe it as see the tumor and then treat the tumor. Uh, of course, it's both on the diagnostic side and then the treatment side as well. Can you paint that overview about Radio Pharmaceuticals, what they really do out there? First of all, you need to be sure that a patient has high probability of responding to a therapy. So what the radio pharmaceutical can do, you need to have a molecule, can be a peptide, can be a monoclonal antibody, and you link this molecule with a low energy isotope. What the molecule does when it's injected in the patient goes and deposits where the tumor is because it's very specific. And the imaging isotope is able to be detected by SPECT, or PET technology. So first of all, we can see in a patient if he has a tumor and where is the tumor. The second step, you take exactly the same molecule, but this time you link with a high energy isotope. The molecule goes exactly in the same place where it went before, but this time there is a release of high energy. And this high energy is able to disrupt the tumor DNA in the cancer cell. So very specific, the objective is really to target and destroy the tumor without affecting the healthy surrounding tissues. 
for sure. It's obviously such an exciting area of treatment. I'd love to ask you as well, you've got a wealth of background and experience in the space, particularly at Novartis, and you've got quite an interesting story about how you came to Radio Farm Theranostics. We've actually spoken to Paul Hopper as well on the channel before, so the viewers are familiar with him. I'd love to know, firstly, what's your background, but also what was the vision that you were sold on and why you're so excited about the Radio Farm Theranostics story? I mean, you're right. I spent more than 20 years in, in Novartis um, in different uh, uh, roles in Europe, in the US, uh, global roles in, in, in breast cancer. But also my last role in Novartis was following the acquisition of a radio pharmaceutical company called AAA. Novartis bought this company uh, for a total of $6 billion because it was AAA and then Endoside in 2020. 2017. And I had the opportunity to move to this division as a chief commercial officer. So I really enjoy learning more about the radio pharmaceutical, uh, of course, um, improving my experience and learning, but also really see the potential. And yeah, I would say quite, quite out of the blue, Paul Hopper uh, called me and uh, he shared with me his vision this vision to build uh, uh, a very successful uh, radio pharmaceutical company, a company that can be a, a player in the top uh, one, two or three in the, in the segment. And I saw the um, vision as a extremely compelling because from one side it's exciting to start from scratch, building the team, uh, uh, contribute to the decision of what molecule should be in our pipeline. But more than ever, there is really um, a big ambition here to uh, play a role for patients living with oncological disease. And knowing that we can do the difference is so important that was, I mean, I couldn't say no. Ultimately, that is the main aim there, isn't it? And you've, to do that, you've got a range of different molecules that you've talked about. You've been collecting assets. Did you want to talk about the pipeline that you've been collecting and where it's currently positioned? When we started the company, we had the opportunity to look at more than 30 assets coming from private company or um, leading academic, academic center. And we decided to focus on four, what we believe, of course, are the most uh, promising uh, four. And this is what we started at the uh, IPO with these uh, four platforms. And, uh, and then after uh, the following month, we decided to add additional two molecules, one from UCLA, so the Los Angeles, uh, of course, university, and the other from Case Western University. So we are now nine molecules, six platform, so a very deep um, pipeline so that we can really address multiple and different disease area. We go from uh, tumor types where there is large prevalence like lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, but also some very interesting disease area where a met need is very high, like um, osteosarcoma, glioblastoma, pancreatic cancer. So really we are addressing a number of unmet medical need with our molecule and really we cannot wait to bring this to clinic and to start treating patients. For sure. Would you describe that as the strategic rationale in terms of the composition of the portfolio, predominantly focused on that first in class uh, side, really looking for the unmet needs and then obviously the best in class as well with some of the other portfolio assets? When we look at companies that were already present in the space, like, of course, a big player like Novartis, we didn't think that was probably the right strategy to go and try to have a part of the market share that you know, a leading company that like Novartis can have in some area. So we decided to go in area where radio pharmaceutical therapy were not yet in development so that we can really focus on new mechanism of action and try to bring something extremely differentiated to the market. As you said, First to market or best in class was really our approach instead of going with me too products. 
And then talking about the pipeline itself, you've got a range of different assets looking to move those through the clinical pathway over the upcoming years. Did you want to talk about where you're currently positioned and what are those key catalysts and trials that investors should look towards moving forward? Well, we, as I mentioned, we like to start clinical trials and we are very close to make it. So in 2022, we expect to have approval to start four phase one clinical trial. Two in Australia, in a patient with non-small cell lung cancer and prostate cancer, and two trial in US in patient with breast cancer and also an imaging agent in pancreatic cancer. So four trials can start very soon. It's really um, our, our focus. But I have to say that we uh, last week we, we became very excited also of one of the products called uh, Dump19, one of our recent acquisition from UCLA, because we receive very good news from um, FDA and we were of course very excited about this asset as well. For sure. Well, yeah, let's talk about uh, Dump19 then. Orphan drug status as well as rare pediatric disease designation. This is significant. Obviously, it's the recognition of it as well, but you also get the priority review vouchers. So did you want to talk about really what that means and the validation that it is for the product? Absolutely. So first of all, the um, orphan um, drug designation is important because the company is receiving financial benefit in conducting clinical trial, seven years of market exclusivity when you launch the, the products. And of course, we can expect that when we go and interact with FDA, FDA is already knowledgeable about the molecule and the expectation of an important products in development will definitely help uh, our uh, conversation. The second that uh, arrived after a week or nine days was rare pediatric. And this is important because uh, osteosarcoma, unfortunately, is a very tough uh, type of cancer, is affecting uh, um, young population uh, and children. Um, and uh, FDA is very uh, sensible when molecule has the potential to treat uh, kids uh, or, or patient in, in young age. Uh, so similar, approach uh, recognition of the molecule but as you mentioned also the uh, the voucher so the voucher is a, a system that fda introduced to further motivate company to invest in research and development in area where there is an high and med medical need as a result when a company receive marketing authorization can decide to use this voucher and they have a further accelerated approval or can decide to transfer and sell the voucher to other company. In the recent years, a majority of the small company decided to sell, uh, usually to large pharmaceutical company. And uh, usually the price of such a voucher is between $100 million to $130 million. So it's, it's huge. And uh, of course, it is uh, still a um, uh, way to go to get there. And we have time to think what to do. But anyhow, it's, it's a nice problem to have when you need to take this the decision. For sure. A nice problem to have. And obviously, great recognition. So it's an exciting pathway up ahead on that front. I'd love to ask you as well, the JV with MD Anderson, very reputable organization, obviously unlocks a lot of doors as well. Did you want to speak about what that means for the Radio Farm story? Yes, as um, Radio Farm Diagnostic, as I mentioned before, we have the ambition to play a critical role in, in oncology. And of course, we cannot do alone. You need to partner with the best. And in this specific case, we had the opportunity to start a conversation with MD Anderson Cancer Center in US, the number one, just recognize again, number one cancer center in, in US. And they told us that they were interested to create a, a joint venture and they were already in discussion with other companies. So we asked, well, can we be um, also in the game, can we uh, present ourselves? Can we share what we like to do? What is our vision of this potential JV? Um, and after a few months, uh, we were uh, 
you know, positive uh, kind of surprise, uh, probably among a large player. And the Anderson decide to, to, you know, to put together their effort with us. And so we created this um, joint venture uh, called a Radio Farm Ventures. Uh, we have a specific mandate that is to develop at least four radio pharmaceutical uh, therapies. Uh, and we will work with their very strong R&D department to do the preclinical work and then the phase one clinical trial together. So this is the mandate of the of the JV. So very exciting, um, this incredible, uh, you know, intellectual power in, in, in that organization. Uh, we have a lot to learn from them and we can definitely put together some very promising plan. It's obviously a major opportunity, as you mentioned, a strong mandate there and it really paints a great pathway up ahead. I did want to ask as well, it's been about 12 months roughly now since you've IPO'd. IPO'd at the issue price of 60 cents. Obviously, global markets have come down as well. What do you think the market's missing about the Radio Farm story with so much going on? And what are those key catalysts that investors should look for moving forward? Well, you know, as a, as a new company, uh, it took a little bit to be uh, known in the market is less than a year uh, since the IPO, is less than a year and a half since the company was was created. So we are a new player and it is normal uh, that it, it is going to, to take some time to be recognized. I mean, investors need to trust us, the market need to trust us. And we believe is a step-by-step, week-by-week and month-by-month uh, activity. We like to speak with, with facts and results. For example, last week, you know, FDA is a reputable uh, third party organization that decided to, to recognize the potential of our products. MD Anderson is all another very reputable organization that recognized the value in Radio Farm Terranostic. And what is important for, for us is really to deliver continuous uh, news about our clinical development program. Investors need to be aware of when we receive authorization, when we start the phase one, and we are not putting all our investment behind the acceleration of clinical development. So to answer your question, we can say many things, but external validation and clinical milestone is what is going to make a difference. And we are fully focused on this. Sure, I appreciate that. And it's been littered throughout the discussion, but I'd love to ask you those longer term aspirations for Radio Farm Theranostics. I know it's been stated that you want to become a leader in the space in terms of treatments and a recognized leader in fighting cancer, which obviously is a very noble cause. And we're hoping that you're able to succeed because of the way that the illness affects so many. But what is that longer term aspiration and that dream for the company? Our first uh, step that we believe is going to be transformational for the company is really our ability to deliver three or four successful phase two trial. Um, this is what we are really focusing. We are completely preclinical. We are starting phase one. We have one asset that is already in phase two A. So we believe that this is a significant milestone for the company out of nine molecules that we have. Of course, we would like all nine to be successful, but of course, we'll be already transformational if we can have uh, four successful readout in phase two. This will be a big uh, transformation for the company. And this is what we are focusing right now. After that, uh, I'm sure there are uh, many options to consider, but now we are focusing uh, in our midterm uh, objective. I appreciate the discussion. Did you have any final reflections that you wanted to share with those holders who have been watching since the IPO or potentially those who might now just be learning about the Radio Farm Theranostic story? I would say stay tuned. Uh, we expect to have uh, quite early in a few weeks uh, a phase two eight readout for our imaging trial uh, is going to be before the end of the year, is going to be before uh, December. Um, so that's a very important uh, readout to see the value of these products and as well to keep following the company. Uh, and we will be, um, you know, always uh, uh, immediately um, available for any question or to share any information that might be interesting for the 
uh, investor. And um, thank you for your time and thank you for um, having me. That is the Radio Farm Theranostic story. It's ASX RAD. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to share it out. Make sure you've liked, subscribed and turn your bell notifications on. Really enjoy that discussion. Ricardo Canavari, thank you so much for the chat. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.